if I talk about citizenship, um, I mean um, a passport. So the legal status that indicates a relation between an individual and a state. And that status that provides rights, such as reflected by the passport, which uh, gives you the right of um, international mobility. You have the right to, of course, enter your own country, uh, to leave your own country, and also to uh, enter other countries, depending on, you could say, the value of your citizenship. Right? So the, the um, yeah, passports, you could say, have different values. With uh, the Dutch citizenship, I, I think you can travel visa-free to, I don't know exactly, maybe like 120 countries or so in the world. Um, but of course, there are some countries uh, where the passport gives you the right only to um, travel visa-free, maybe to a limited number of countries. And of course, traveling visa-free is important for mobility. Um, many of you might have experienced that, that coming to the to the Netherlands and to Maastricht. So for some of you who come from outside of the Netherlands, it's much easier if you are from another EU member state. You don't have any problems. You can just come to the Netherlands and study here. But if you come from elsewhere in the world, it might become more complicated. You need to acquire a visa. And when, once you're in the Netherlands, you might uh, travel within the Schengen zone, but maybe not to the United Kingdom, for example. Right. So um, depending on what kind of citizenship status you have, you you might run into more or less uh, troubles when you want to get around the world, and that's what many of us want to do, right? We want to travel and go where we, uh, as we please, in, in, uh, in principle. Um, well, citizenship also, of course, is a political instrument, so uh, it gives you also a right, for example, the right to vote. Right? So um, uh, you can vote often, uh, in principle, for national elections, um, also local, and here in the Netherlands we have elections coming up uh, um, soon, which will be the provincial elections. Are there any Dutch citizens here? Oh, there are quite a few. Okay, so everyone who will raise their hand can vote in the provincial elections. Um, and actually you can vote um, twice in the near future because you will also be able to vote for the European Parliament elections. Um, and um, yeah, of course, if you are an EU citizen living in the Netherlands, then you can actually choose in most cases, uh, whether you want to vote for the Dutch representatives of the European Parliament or whether you want to vote for the representatives of your own country. Uh, actually, that depends a little bit. So, are there any Danes here? Oh, there's one from Denmark. So, if you want to uh, vote for the European Parliament elections, I don't think you have the right to vote uh, for the Danish representatives if you are officially residing in the Netherlands. So, Denmark actually has restrictions with regard to voting from abroad. Right? Um, so in, in that sense, um, you could, but, uh, as an EU citizen living in the Netherlands, you can vote for the Dutch representatives, right? Or maybe you want to go back to Denmark and vote there, right? So this depends a bit on your individual uh, situation. Okay, you see I get sidetracked very quickly when I talk about citizenship. Uh, just to clarify that it's an important status and, and many of us um, take it for granted, but depending on your life situation, of course, it will be important to acquire another citizenship. Uh, might I ask, and you don't have to answer this, is there anyone who has acquired citizenship through naturalization? Okay, two, three, so uh, a couple. Um, so, um, yeah, you have acquired the Dutch uh, citizenship, I think, right? Mm -hmm. um, and actually, this is a hotly contested uh, topic. So, in the Netherlands, we are currently reflecting on the citizenship law. Um, whether um, to make it um, in a way easier to acquire Dutch citizenship because at the moment if you want to become a Dutch citizen normally speaking you have to give up your other citizenship right? <coughs> but it depends a bit if you're married to a Dutch citizen for example you don't have to do that um, and this is important because uh, there are many people from the United Kingdom in the Netherlands is there anyone from the UK? Right. so uh, you guys of course will be uh, yeah, uh, uh, considering your uh, your options at the moment, right? Because as a UK citizen until the 29th of March, you are also an EU citizen, and after that, God be with you, and we don't know exactly <laughs> we don't know exactly what's going to happen, right? Um, so for many people, they want to insure themselves and acquire a second citizenship. Right? Some people already have a second citizenship, but. Um, Many people, of course, British citizens, they have now acquired Irish citizenship because many have family links with Ireland. Um, but actually, there are also <coughs> quite a few um, uh, British citizens residing in the Netherlands who are now becoming uh, Dutch. And they said, well, I've been living here for a long time, and as an EU citizen, I never thought much about it. I was never that interested, but now with Brexit, I decided to go for it. 
Now this decision to acquire that citizenship will be easier if you have a Dutch partner because then you don't have to give up your Dutch citizenship. And the Brits, they are fine with uh, double citizenship, so the, you don't lose automatically your British uh, nationality. Um, vice versa, there are actually also many people from the Netherlands who reside in the United Kingdom. Uh, actually about 100,000, so it's a big group. And um, they are also considering the, um, their future and um, yeah, their residence uh, status, of course, becomes more insecure now that uh, once, the, once the EU, once the UK exits the EU. Well, we still have to wait and see what happens. But in principle, if the, EU, if the UK exits the European Union, then the Dutch citizens will have to acquire a different kind of residence status. And what happens after uh, 29th of March is still unsure, because, of course, the EU and the UK negotiated... Um, a regime um, for what happens with the Brits residing in the EU and for the uh, EU citizens residing in the UK, but if there is no uh, agreement and no deal, then we don't know what happens, right? And so then you may be really in trouble. Mm -hmm. So what, um, what the Netherlands said, and Austria uh, is also considering this, so the Netherlands has said um, for all UK citizens who reside in the Netherlands, we will... Um, um, prolong automatically their resident status, so they will be able to reside here, so you don't have to worry in the short term, right? irrespective of whether there is a deal or no deal. But there are many uh, Dutch who, um, who are in the UK who want to acquire British citizenship to um, consolidate and secure their status in the United Kingdom. So under the current regime, this means that um, you can, as a Dutch citizen, if you have lived in uh, the UK for a long time and you are, you are able to pass the life in the UK test and you're willing to pay over a thousand pounds for it, then you can become a British citizen. Um, but under current law, this means that you lose your Dutch nationality and once you lose your Dutch nationality, you lose EU citizenship, right? And so then you have a, a secure status in the United Kingdom but you lose your mobility in the EU. It's not also particularly uh, attractive. So that's why there has been a lot of pressure on the Dutch government to um, actually do what most of the world has done, namely to accept uh, dual citizenship. Right? Because most countries in the world nowadays, this was different 50 years ago, they actually uh, acquire, they accept um, um, double citizenship. And so there has been pressure by the expats from the Netherlands on the Dutch government to make a more liberal uh, regime. And the government has said that they are considering it, but we are still uh, waiting to see what happens. And and nobody um, really knows. Um, and so, actually, citizenship policy is a highly yeah, political issue. Um, so this week, I don't know if anyone, well, there are many Dutch, so you've maybe seen the news about uh, Geert Wilders. D did anyone see what Wilders uh, proposed this week about citizenship? To not, yeah? To not allow people um, dual citizenship into the same chamber. Exactly. Well, actually, not only in the parliament, but also in other political, uh, uh, in many other political um, offices, right? And so, um, yeah, Wilders, who is the uh, leader of the Freedom Party, has proposed that, um, well, given that it's actually very difficult to restrict dual citizenship, because in the Netherlands we are restrictive, but we actually have about 1.3 million dual citizens in the in the Netherlands, and this may be because they fall under an exception for the naturalization procedure, or because they just have two parents with uh, different citizenships, and then you automatically often acquire the dual citizenship at birth, and yeah, there's not much that states can do about it, um, and so builders propose something that actually very few countries do, the only country that is well known to have this is uh, Australia, is there anyone from Australia? Uh, so Australia has the policy in place that Wilders has proposed, namely to, to only allow citizens to be elected into parliament if they have only one citizenship. Um, so instead of restricting the access to citizenship, he wants to restrict what you can do with it. Um, this is actually highly problematic in Australia. This has, given, uh, has led to a lot of fuss this year, and, um, because the problem is that actually uh, not everyone knows how many citizenships they have, this might, might sound a bit weird to you because you might think, well, I know which citizenship they have, but sometimes if you have um, an ancestor who was, was a citizen, maybe you, by uh, some kind of descent, even though you have never applied for the passport and have not prolonged the passport, you might still be a citizen of a country. So it is not always clear if you are a citizen of a country. And in Australia, of course, there are many people with uh, yeah, all kinds of mixed uh, ancestry. And once you find out that you are a citizen of a country, it may actually not be so easy to, um, to get rid of it, right? So uh, 
actually in the United States, it's extremely expensive to renounce your citizenship. Is there anyone from the US? Right, so um, if at some point you are fed up with uh, the United States um, and you really like it here in the Netherlands, then uh, you know, maybe you can become a Dutch citizen and, um, and you say, well, I'm done with the United States, right? One thing with the United States is that they, for example, tax uh, people abroad, right? So actually, if you want to keep your US citizenship, you have to always submit these tax declarations. This also means if you want to get out of it, you have to pay, you have to buy off your future tax debt uh, uh, obligation, so to say. Right? So actually, there, were, there are the political debates about citizenship in many countries, in, in most countries in the world, you could say, and they might go into various directions. So um, in the Netherlands, the last uh, 15 years, they have gone mostly in a restrictive direction. So in the Netherlands, we say, well, okay, you can become a citizen, but you have to do something in order to become a citizen. Um, not only give up your other citizenship if, if, uh, if you are not married to a Dutch and if you are not from a country that doesn't allow you to renounce it, um, but you also have to do um, a test. Uh, you did the test, maybe, right? And so um, was it difficult or easy? It was harder than I thought, mm. because I also already thought I spoke Dutch, I could read Dutch, I had done the, the uh, secondary school tests and mm. the whole thing, and it was, it was harder than I thought, but I got it. Yeah. I, uh, it, it was, but it was hard work, yeah. yeah. Well, and of course, you're an educated person, so for somebody with less education, it will be probably more difficult, right? And that's exactly what we are interested in in our research. So um, these um, conditions under which you can acquire citizenship, they vary between countries. And what is the, um, uh, what is the impact of that on, um, on, natural, on the naturalization, what we call naturalization propensity? So the, let's say the probability that somebody can acquire uh, citizenship. So that's what, I, yeah, what I'm interested in. Um, how can immigrants acquire citizenship and also what does it mean for them? We talk a little bit about what citizenship means for people, but um, um, I, today, in, um, so this is the topic of the, the, the research project uh, more generally, um, how do you acquire citizenship and what does it mean for people and how does this mean the different, how does the, yeah, how does the meaning of citizenship perhaps differ between the migrant uh, groups? So today I want to talk about um, um, let's say the first part of the question, how do you acquire citizenship and what do we know scientifically about the factors that explain why some migrants actually acquire citizenship and other uh, migrants might not acquire citizenship. Is this only because some people are interested and other people are not? Or are there certain conditions, for example an integration test that you have to do that make it more difficult for some and easier for others? Um, let me just say that this is a comparative paper where we compare uh, the Netherlands uh, Denmark and Sweden, and um, I do this uh, not uh, by myself, but with uh, three others, so with Anna Tekinematica, Floris Peters, who is sitting there, maybe you can raise your hand, so, uh, Floris also uh, shares the credit for the work that we've done, um, and um, another colleague uh, from, um, from Sweden, um, Peter Bevelander. What we do in this paper is analyze the question under which conditions are, are some migrants more likely or less likely to acquire citizenship? Um, and we do this on the basis of um, population register data. So much of the research in this field, right, because if we, if we want to investigate this, we have to use uh, certain data. So some studies approach this qualitatively, so there's quite a bit of literature that uh, interviews migrants, you know, why are you interested to, sit, to acquire citizenship, was this very difficult? Um, but there's actually also a long tradition of quantitative research where we uh, traditionally speaking use um, um, information from surveys. Um, and surveys can be very interesting because you can ask anything that you want to uh, or that you can think of, you could ask it to people, but of course they're also very expensive and, and they're often also selective in the sense that some people participate in the survey and other people do not. Um, and Another downside is that if you do a survey at one point in time, you can only get information about people at that single moment in time, but you cannot track them over a longer period. And what we are interested in is uh, understanding the naturalization propensity over the life course of the immigrant, so over a longer time period. And what we do in this paper is analyze about um, 600,000 migrants who reside in these three countries um, from eight uh, migrant cohorts, so they have arrived between 1994 and 2001, and we track them 
um, up to 15 years after they have migrated. And then for every single year we have an observation for each individual. This adds up to about uh, four, 4 million observations. And so the, um, yeah, the results that I share um, are based on these uh, 4 million observations, individual year combinations in these three countries which we are based on the register data. Right? Register data is the type of data that we use in the Netherlands. So if you are living in Maastricht and you are registered with the municipality, um, yeah, those data are aggregated at the national level by the statistical office and are made available under, of course, strict privacy conditions to uh, researchers who are interested in analyzing these um, public policy questions. Okay, um, so what's the puzzle of the paper? Right? Well, the puzzle of the paper is, you could say, the puzzle of the naturalization gap. Um, um, Right, so if, um, if citizenship would mean the same, and largely speaking in the Netherlands, in Denmark and Sweden, you could say the rights that are linked to citizenship are actually very comparable. Right? Because you are an EU citizen, once you become a citizen of the Netherlands, uh, Denmark and Sweden, um, it gives you voting rights in those countries, uh, so international mobility and similar kinds of entitlements. Uh, that are linked with citizenship. So if we look at the same kind of migrants from the same countries of origin who arrive at the same age and who are married or not, so all the, uh, the factors that we control for in our statistical models, we would expect that actually um, um, the uh, naturalization rates should be more or less uh, similar, right? Because especially after 15 years, right? So in Denmark, it takes a bit longer before you can um, naturalize. Do you know how long it takes in Denmark? I think it depends if you're, if you're married to a Dane or if you're married to nine years, if you're not married to um, a Dane, then you have to wait for nine years. Mm -hmm. How long is this in the Netherlands? Five, five years, right? So uh, actually five years, if you, unless you fall under some of the additional conditions. So if you have been married to, the, to a Dutch citizen, you, you can already naturalize a bit, a bit faster after three years of marriage with a Dutch citizen. Right? So this is for some of you who are interested to uh, become a Dutch citizen. That's really the best way into uh, citizenship, right? Marry a Dutch person uh, because you can naturalize fast and you don't have to give up your other nationality right? under the current uh, situation. Of course, the marriage has to be genuine, right? So let me just clarify this. Um, so, if citizenship would mean the same, we would expect that, um, that, um, that migrants would be equally interested in this, especially because citizenship in all three of these countries leads to EU citizenship, and so this gives you a lot of rights. But what we see, in fact, is that the um, percentage of um, migrants that acquire citizenship varies really enormously. Um, so in Denmark, only 28% of the migrants um, after 15 years um, has become a Danish citizen. If we look at the whole uh, period, and I will show you that actually this uh, number has been decreasing uh, even further over time. In Sweden, this is up to three quarters of the people after 15 years. And so the Netherlands, we are somewhere in between, right? Also has been decreasing, but uh, it's still uh, internationally, uh, you could say comparatively reasonable, right? So Sweden is really like, extremely high, the naturalization rates. It's also a very liberal uh, policy. And Denmark is exceptionally uh, low. Um, and so, if people would be equally interested, we wouldn't expect such a gap, right? And so, now what we're interested in is, um, yeah, why do some migrants naturalize and some not? And in Denmark, is it because they are not interested in this, or is it because uh, maybe uh, the, 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 um, the context makes it more difficult for them? Right? And there is actually a big, um, yeah, there's a big body of literature, so we know actually quite a bit about naturalization, uh, if you're interested. Uh, send me an email or look at the publications that we have on our website of the project and you will find a lot of uh, references there. But it's a really pretty exciting um, research field that goes back already to the 1930s actually, uh, but most more recently uh, you could say um, yeah, the 1980s and the 1990s and uh, the last uh, two decades. We have a lot of uh, literature. So it's a topic that has been really quite extensively um, studied. right? So why do, why do some migrants naturalize and some not? Well, traditionally in the literature, um, we, people have looked especially at uh, where does an immigrant come from? Um, why is that important? Well, it relates actually to this um, value of citizenship that I already uh, mentioned in the beginning. Right? So if you are from a country that is highly developed, 
which also provides you a highly valuable citizenship, um, then perhaps you don't have to naturalize because as an American, it's easy to travel to the Netherlands and to stay here, right? Comparatively uh, easy. So you don't really need to become a Dutch citizen to secure your, let's say, uh, future here. You could easily live here for the rest of your life without becoming a Dutch citizen, right? Um, of course, if you were to live here the rest of your life, I don't know if you're interested in that or not, maybe you're fed up with it at some point. Um, but if you're interested in this, maybe uh, at some point you start to work here, you pay taxes, and then you think, well, now that I start to pay taxes and I really have a stake in the future of the country, I also want to express my political uh, sentiments, right? So I want to be able to vote, right? So if you want to vote, of course, you still have to, um, to, uh, to naturalize. But for many of the more practical issues which we find from the literature that is is often the most um, important thing that migrants uh, mention. That, well, why do you naturalize? Because I want to secure my, my status here. Um, for people from highly developed countries, from politically very stable countries, um, and actually uh, from relatively nearby countries, they are generally speaking less likely to naturalize. Um, right? So political situation is of course important if you are uh, a refugee. Um, yeah, you're fleeing your own country. Um, and so you are not only, not only does your, the, the citizenship of your country provide maybe limited rights in the world, but uh, on top of it you are persecuted within your own uh, country, right? So this is even, is even um, uh, worse. So migrants from, um, yeah, from uh, politically unstable countries, they are more likely to naturalize. Um, well, then we have... Um, People have looked at life course variables. So it's not only where you are from, but also what kind of life situation you are in. Um, age at migration, how old are you when you migrated? Why would this matter? Anyone an idea? Because when you're younger, you're probably more likely to, to apply for citizenship. Yeah, perhaps. why? Because you have a whole future, perhaps. Exactly, like right? So uh, you could say, uh, Citizenship, naturalization is part of the, yeah, the, the way that migrants plan their lives, right? Um, and some of us plan more than others, but we take this into um, account, right? And so if you're younger, especially if you have to invest in acquiring it, right? So if you have to learn Dutch, um, um, then actually it, it becomes, and in Denmark even more, because uh, becoming Danish is actually even more difficult. You not only have to wait for nine years, but you have to also speak Danish, or you also have to speak Dutch, but you have to speak Dutch at the level A2, which is, uh, you could say, beginner's uh, level, but uh, in Denmark you have to speak uh, level B2, mm -hmm. right? And so this is actually intermediate, uh, upper intermediate, right? So uh, for you it will be easy to speak Dutch, but for the rest of us, it will, or done Danish, but for us, it will, uh, the rest of us, it will be actually difficult, right? So if you have to invest in this, also, from an economic perspective, the, you have more payoff if you naturalize, uh, if you have still your whole life ahead of you, right? So, generally speaking, we expect that um, there is a, a negative relation. The older you are when you arrive, the less likely you are to naturalize. Um, but this might make sense, but actually when we look at the literature, we find a pretty blurry picture. So, in some studies we do find this, and in others we find that actually age at migration doesn't really matter that much. Or we find that there is a curvilinear relation. Migrants naturalize when they arrive very young or when they are older, but not when they are, so let's say, in their 30s or 40s. So we don't really know exactly what is uh, going on. The idea in our paper is that the way in which um, these factors matter is also conditioned by the context. Right? So the, your decision to naturalize will be much easier if you... Um, if getting the citizenship is not too difficult, right? So if it is, if it is very easy to acquire citizenship, maybe age doesn't really matter so much because we are all interested to vote and secure our status, right? But if it is very difficult, then we might expect that actually age at migration matters more, right? So what we want to do with the paper is, in a way, um, take this set of um, variables that we find in the literature and contextualize them, right? Because it would actually not be very plausible to assume that all these variables here would matter to the same degree under uh, very different uh, conditions. Um, so partner and children, what we find often is that uh, migrants who have a native partner, they are more likely to naturalize. Now this may be because it is easier, right? So you, you, um, you can naturalize faster or maybe you don't have to give up your nationality, other nationality like in the Netherlands, but we also see it as um, a link to the country where you reside, right? So to, to the destination country. <coughs> um, 
Well, education, we see generally speaking that higher educated migrants are more likely to naturalize than lower educated migrants. Um, well, it's actually not really clear. I wrote here interest versus capability, why that is. Is it because higher educated migrants are more interested to naturalize? But some people have argued this because as a, as a naturalized citizen you might have access to certain type of jobs, uh, let's say public sector jobs if you want to work for the government or uh, be a police officer or you want to be a judge, then you have to be a citizen. And those kind of jobs will be typically available only to higher educated migrants. So for the lower educated migrants, um, where uh, nationality is not an, uh, a relevant factor, they, the payoff of citizenship is uh, lower. So they might be less, they might be less um, interested to naturalize. However, if we would um, follow that reasoning, then we would expect that when we compare countries where the conditions under which you can acquire citizenship are very different, that there wouldn't be a big difference between higher and lower educated uh, migrants between these three countries, because the payoff of citizenship in the type of jobs that you can get is more or less the same in the Netherlands, Sweden, and Denmark. Um, so may and if we were to see that uh, education matters, especially in countries like Denmark and maybe the Netherlands, uh, where getting citizenship is more difficult because you have to do language tests and integration tests, then maybe it is more about capability, right? Because doing these kind of tests will be easier for people for who it is easier to learn the language, especially Danish level B2. It's not for it's not a, yeah it's not a reasonable feasible option for actually for, for probably for most of us, right? So acquiring a, a language, uh, learning a language at that level is really difficult. Well, we see that generally speaking, um, employed migrants are more likely to naturalize. Um, it's important to, to um, right, in, in some other studies we also look at uh, whether citizenship actually lead to more employment. So there are some, uh, in, in those studies we need to take into account that there may be a certain uh, selection into naturalization. But um, maybe it is because the, if you have to pay fees then you earn more uh, wage and it's easier to pay the fee for naturalization. Um, in Denmark, for example, uh, it's actually a, a requirement, so you cannot have uh, social assistance if you want to become a, cit a citizen. Right? So in that sense, we would also expect. Um, but then policy, we would expect. People have looked at this in the in the literature that policy matters. For example, can you keep your dual, your other citizenship or not? Um, generally speaking, we would expect that migrants are more likely to naturalize if the country doesn't force them to give up their previous citizenship because the costs are lower. Uh, and this is a very intuitive reasoning, but we still find that um, in the literature the findings are a bit ambiguous. So we find that this is the case in some countries and not in others. So we're not exactly sure um, yeah, what's going on there. And then under which, what other kind of conditions do you have to fulfill? Um, okay, I have to speed up a little bit. Um, right, so um, it's actually a really rich uh, field. So there's a lot of literature. Um, and what we are interested in especially is the, uh, you could say, the interaction between these three uh, first categories of factors and the fourth, right? So to what extent does the variation in policy condition the relevance of these other uh, variables? Or in other words, um, you could say, uh, to what extent are the restrictive pr uh, procedures uh, affecting some migrants more than others? Now, if we are interested in this, the literature is actually, uh, yeah, there are limitations in the literature because most research has investigated immigrant naturalization propensity only in a single destination country. So then, of course, you cannot analyze the conditions under which um, you can naturalize matter for these other factors. Um, even more problematic is that some of these studies, they have looked only at specific migrant groups, so the, then the, uh, you could say the external validity is, rel is relatively limited. There are a couple of studies that have taken into account destination country variation. Bloomrad study, she compares the uh, United States and Canada, compares uh, Portuguese and uh, Vietnamese in Boston and Toronto. It's a really interesting study. Um, and that's one way to go about, but of course the, yeah, you could say the uh, generalizability of that study is more limited. Um, then there are some studies who compare, who use um, aggregate level data. So. Um, about, um, let's say, national level uh, naturalization rates to compare between countries, which is also interesting, but then it doesn't allow us to investigate these individual level variables that we are interested in. Um, and finally, most of these studies, in as far as they um, 
investigators, they actually only use uh, cross-sectional data, so they look at only they only have observations for each migrant at one point in time. Okay, so what we do in the paper is compare these three countries, the Netherlands, Denmark, and uh, Sweden. Um, we think that they're very comparable because they are broadly similar in their, let's say, socioeconomic, political setup. Their rights uh, tied to citizenship are very similar. You become an EU citizen. And especially important, we have similar kind of data available in these um, countries. Right? So longitudinal micro data, which are not available to everyone. So if you want to do this, it will probably be difficult because you cannot just say, well, I would like to use these data. You have to be affiliated with the statistical office. Uh, of course, sign confidential confidentiality agreements and yeah, make sure that you uh, um, um, yeah, use these data in, um, uh, with, uh, with due safeguards for, for privacy. And they're especially interesting to compare because the citizenship policies are very different. I mentioned already most of it. So Sweden is the most liberal, especially after 2001. There's no dual citizenship uh, ban. Um, you can naturalize after five years and you basically don't have to fulfill any additional requirements. Um, if you have a criminal record, it may lead to some delay, but that's more or less it. Um, Denmark is, uh, you could say, extremely restrictive, only uh, initially after seven years, since 2002 after nine years. For a long time, you had to renounce your uh, other citizenship, and in 2015, it liberalized uh, dual citizenship, and the Netherlands is somewhere in between. We also introduced the test in 2003, but it's less difficult than the Danish one. Uh, we ban dual citizenship, but actually with quite a few exceptions. Um, so it's an interesting, we say, in-between case. We look only at foreign-born migrants, who are at least 18 years when they arrive in the countries, um, and they are not yet a citizen. So we can measure all these things in the register. And we look at these cohorts, 94 to 2001, because we want to track people over a long time, and we want to cover some of the changes that we identify uh, in the citizenship law. So we uh, have an observation period of 97 to 2016 from three years. Uh, before three years, um, most migrants are not eligible to, na to naturalize um, and up to 15 years. So we track people from three years, even though in Denmark you can only uh, naturalize after seven or nine years because we are interested to see how the difference in, uh, you could say, eligibility um, conditions also affects the naturalization propensity. But, uh, we have a robustness check where we, where we also rerun the analysis uh, only for the <laughs> eligible uh, population. Come back to this at the end. Um, well, we explore the uh, cumulative naturalization rates with so-called Kaplan-Meier estimators. That's important because not everyone stays in the country for the full 15 years. Some people leave on the, along the way. Um, and we analyze the propensity with so-called Cox proportional hazard models. Um, well, I'm going to skip this. Um, Okay, so what do we see, right? Uh, I already mentioned this, actually we see really uh, huge differences. So first of all, from a political perspective in terms of representation of migrant groups who live for a long time in the country and often have a job and pay uh, taxes and have a real stake in the country where they live, the um, naturalization rates, the big naturalization gap is really worrisome, right? Because in, Den in Sweden, three quarters of the migrants naturalizes, but in Denmark only about a quarter. Right, so this means that three quarters of the migrants who live there for 15 years doesn't have the right to vote in the Danish national elections, and they may or may not be uh, yeah, um, a bit uncertain about the extent to which they can stay. Right? Normally speaking, they will have a long-term residence permit in Denmark, and the Netherlands falls in between. What's important to keep in mind is that these uh, differences I already mentioned, they become bigger over time. So if we split this out by cohort, and that's a nice thing with these register data. We can, uh, let's say, tease out some of these differences um, um, that we're interested in. We see that among the 94 cohort, for example, the Netherlands and Sweden, well, you guys in the back cannot see it, I guess, but uh, they are, they're much closer towards 75%, uh, right? Whereas here, the Netherlands dives under the 50%, and Sweden is still more or less around the 75%. So Sweden more or less continuously stays um, at a really high uh, level. Um, the Netherlands declines and Denmark even declines much more. So here it was still, let's say, 30, uh, 38 percent, but um, it, it goes uh, quite uh, substantially below 20 percent, right? So of the cohort of 2001 who, uh, who has stayed in Denmark for 15 years, uh, it's actually less than 20 percent who has naturalized. Okay, 
Um, now we're going to show the uh, results of the Cox uh, model. So I don't know if you guys in your econometrics uh, classes have worked with uh, Cox proportional hazard models or survival models or event history models. Um, so we track people over time and we control for both time constant factors, like where is somebody from, and time varying factors. Are they at some point married and at some point not? Do they get a child and so on, right? And so this is a, um, a model that allows us to analyze this in a dynamic way. And um, yeah, this is a survival model where we measure the risk that somebody naturalizes. So it's uh, the measurement of the survival rate of not being naturalized, you could say. Um, what's important in these Cox models is the hazard ratio. Um, one is the benchmark, so if um, the uh, hazard ratio goes below one, then somebody has um, a lower propensity to naturalize. If the hazard ratio goes over one, the, um, the likelihood to naturalize is uh, higher. Um, and I can show you a series of these graphs, but we don't have time to deal with everything. Um, maybe this one is important to look into this a bit. So, um, And of course, we, um, we, here we... Um, yeah, we categorize all the variables in order to look to easily um, identify the relative uh, effect of um, of these uh, categories. So, if you look at the gender at the top, the reference category is male. So, what we analyze is the risk that somebody naturalizes if he or she, if if uh, this, that person is a woman compared to being a man. Right? Um, you see the three dots from the three different countries. They are all circled all around uh, the, the baseline, so the, the one, so the hazard ratio is close to one, which means that actually it doesn't really make a difference if you are a man or a woman in terms of your likelihood to naturalize. That's actually interesting because many of the phenomena that we are interested in are of course highly gendered, but it seems that uh, naturalization is not one of those phenomena, so it doesn't really make a difference if you are a man or a woman. Right? Possibly if we tease this out with interactions, it may be that there are some uh, differences, but in the, the baseline model we don't see any differences. Now we look at um, age at migration. Um, so we discussed this earlier, right? And um, uh, if we follow your expectations, what we would expect, so the reference category is if you arrive when you are between 18 and 30, and then we look at 31 to 40, 41 to 50, and 50 years and older. If we, if we follow the, the standard reasoning from the literature, we would expect that the relationship would be negative. Right? So uh, this means um, that uh, in uh, Denmark, right, and um, these uh, horizontal lines, they indicate the confidence intervals. They are a bit bigger in Denmark because we have yeah, a, a fewer mi the migrant population in Denmark is smaller. What we see is that um, only Denmark actually fulfills this uh, traditional assumption, expectation of um, uh, life course, age at migration mattering to the extent that if you are, uh, if you arrive when you are younger, you are more likely to naturalize. In, you could say in, uh, in, in the Netherlands and in Sweden, actually it doesn't really make that much of a, a difference, right? Um, this fits with our expectation that actually the meaning of these life course variables is conditioned by the institutional context, right? And this makes sense because if you want to become a citizen in, in Sweden, it is really very easy. So even when you arrive when you're 50, you have, of course, still a large part of your life ahead of you nowadays. Uh, and so getting the citizenship of Sweden will also be very important for people who are older when they arrive. And so if it is also a reasonable uh, option, then actually we also see that many people um, uh, naturalize. Actually, we see that it slightly increases, which may be Maybe it's that because they are more certain about their future, whereas people who are younger when they arrive, they are less clear about their future. We don't know exactly what that is, but the big picture is that um, yeah, um, age migration matters, especially under more restrictive conditions. Um, well, what we see, partner is really important. So uh, actually, it's one of the most important variables. So your naturalization propensity strongly depends on your partner. But what we see is that actually it depends especially on whether your partner is uh, native-born or foreign-born, and if the partner is foreign-born, whether the partner is naturalized or not. Right? So the reference category is not having a partner, so we compare people who have a foreign-born partner, so also an immigrant, um, who has not yet naturalized. Right? And you are actually less likely to naturalize yourself if, if you have a partner who is also a migrant who hasn't naturalized. That makes sense from our life course perspective, because we see that migrants often 
plan their naturalization together. In some analysis that Flores did um, for his dissertation, yeah, he found that actually migrants are really likely to naturalize in the same year that their partner also does. For, so for two immigrant, immigrants, they often do this together. And we see this here in the sense that uh, you're really likely to naturalize if also your partner is uh, naturalized. Um, whereas actually native born, um, so in, um, in uh, Denmark and Sweden, actually there isn't much of a difference whether you have a native born partner or no uh, partner. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention of this uh, slide is education, really important. Um, so what we um, would expect that uh, education, right, is this about capability of interest, well if it is about interest we wouldn't really expect big differences between these three these three destination countries. And what we see is that education really matters much more in um, Denmark than in both um, the Netherlands and Sweden. Actually, in Sweden, education hardly matters. Right? If you ignore for the moment this category that we include here, the unknown category, where we don't have any registered education in the, in the registry, we see that actually in Denmark, compared to um, people who have lower levels of education, whether you have, uh, let's say, um, high school or whether you have university level really doesn't matter, right? This reflects, of course, the, yeah, the social democratic um, context of Sweden and the accessibility of the, um, of the uh, citizenship um, regime. So it is easy, relatively easy, and so it, when it is easy to, um, sit, to acquire citizenship, there's also less stratification. Um, whereas you see in the Netherlands, whether you have high school or university, uh, level education already depends a bit, uh, it's already actually quite a bit uh, more important, but it's really important in um, Denmark, right? And this reflects the fact that uh, actually in order to become a citizen, we actually um, really um, yeah, uh, expect um, a lot from you. I, ha I had a couple of uh, slides which I'm going to skip, but I want to have one half a minute to uh, share the conclusions. Um, I'd say what we see is that there is really uh, a long-term naturalization gap. This is also a, a representation gap. Uh, this gap widens under increasingly restrictive conditions. Um, if we are theorizing about why somebody naturalizes uh, or not, and there's a long-standing uh, body of literature, actually we cannot assume that the factors that we theorize are um, yeah, independent from uh, the context. So for this uh, kind of topic, and I would imagine that this applies for many topics that you are interested in, it's really important to have a contextualized uh, theory. Um, well, also the um, policy relevance, of course, means that when countries introduce these kind of restrictions, like you have to learn Dutch at A2 or Danish at B1, often you could say that there are good reasons for this. Well, of course, it's important that somebody speaks the language if they want to participate in uh, society. But what we have to be aware of is that these conditions also have a very, have a strongly stratifying impact. So these conditions make it more difficult for some migrants than for others. And so instead of actually leading to more integration by improving the language capaci capacity, it actually leads to less integration in the sense that you exclude big part of the migrant uh, population. So that's what we uh, found here. And I'm happy to discuss this further. Thanks. Okay.